how do you make the decision on what graph material to use in your cases? Well, I like to make things very simple. I'm a simple kind of person. I, I look at things kind of in a simple way. And so I say there's basically two types of graphs that I'm going to be doing. One is going to be something that's going to be what I call a veneer graft. So it, it is analogous, analogous to uh, a plumping procedure where I don't need this graft for support really. I just need it to hold tissue in a way for aesthetic reasons. So I call it a veneer graft. It might be something like on a congenitally missing laterals where the bone is deficient on the facial. And what I need to do is I need to plump that up, not because I need space for the bone for the implant, because the bone can go into the autogenous bone and the implant can go into the autogenous bone. All right. There's plenty of bone for that. There's just not enough for the aesthetic purposes. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll use a veneer graft there. And for my veneer grafts, I like something that hangs around for a real long time. So I like xenografts. So that's where I use xenografts. However, I never put a xenograph in a hole, okay? I never put a xenograph in a hole. The reason is, is that I don't want something to hang around forever in my hole, in my socket. What I want is I want it to turn over eventually to try to turn over into real bone. And so historically, that choice is, is an allograft typically mineral law. So a mineralized cortical concellus mix, historically it had been a 50-50 mix, and I think now that the, the newer products are coming out and they're more like a like a like an 80-20 mix, I think is the new products have a little bit more cortical uh, uh, or, and less uh, uh, trabecular bone in there. So they, they hang around a little longer. So that's what we've traditionally done. Now, it's very, very important to understand something. If you're doing a socket graft, so you're grafting the socket with the intent of going back in there and placing an implant later, do not heavily pack that socket with anything. Whether you've chosen to use xenograft because you're in a country that doesn't allow people to use autographs or allographs rather, or you're just your predic your 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 disposition is to use it, it's going to be in the way. In other words, it's filler material, guys. It's not bone. And so even when you use a, a, a mineralized cortical concellus chips, if you pack it really, really heavy and you look at the radiographs four, five, six months later, you're going to see the brightest, whitest, glowing uh, socket ever. And if it's glowing white, that isn't a sign of success. When you look at that on the radiograph and you think, wow, look at my bone graph. Look how beautiful it is. I can see it clear as day. What I see is a lack of human bone. You, you have occupied the space with filler material. It's like styrofoam. It's not real bone. So if you've ever had the opportunity to place an implant into one of these really well densely packed sites, you will find it's really, really terrible quality bone. It is not good bone because the only good bone is the bone that healed around it, which if you've overpacked it, really condensed, you have little of. So the, the point here is that placing the bone graft to hold the space, to hold the volume, is a good idea, but don't overpack it because you need to let the blood flow around it to start the healing process to create real bone, natural bone, okay? So your goal should be at the end to maybe say, have 80% natural bone with 20% of the particulate. Still not what you'd really like to do. If you had your druthers, I would do an autograft. I would go to the ramus or the tuberosity and I would harvest bone and I would place that in the socket all day long, okay? Because now you're going to get real bone in that site and you're going to get a better outcome, okay? Now, the second thing is, what about gap grafting? So when we gap graft, are you okay using like a, a cortical bone there? Yes. Why? Because when you're gap grafting, you're getting primary stability based on the five thread rule. The five thread rule says if you're engaging five threads with, within the threads of the implant are engaging five threads of native bone, the probability of, of stability is really high. Okay, so if you're using the five thread rule, you're getting stability from the native bone, you still have a gap. So you gap graft that, you're not relying on that in three to four months to place an implant. All you're asking it to do is hold the space during the healing process. So that can be a very, very predictable outcome. However, going into a site that's been grafted that is predominantly fake bone, 
crappy bone, not real bone, is a high risk for implant failure. And this will be something that I suspect will become more obvious as we go forward, as more and more people start to encounter this. And they go, you know, I went into this, this grafted site and I got good primary stability. I got good torque. I read good torque on my torque meter at the time of insertion. And it didn't integrate right. And it, it, it's, it didn't integrate right. And then I had a failure to integrate. And so more and more people are going to start seeing this because that's what happens because that bone's not good. So in, in general, be very, very careful about going into grafted sites. Those are high-risk endeavors. If you're grafting around an implant at the time of placing, it's a low-risk endeavor because it's just holding the volume. Hopefully that helps. Gap grafting with a mineralized cortical cancellus grafts, a socket grafting with a mineralized cortical cancellus, and then veneer grafting for something you want to hang around for a long time with something like a xenograft works really well. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, the Smile Engineer, helping you re-engineer your practice every day.